Everybody hear me up there okay? Good. On behalf of the African American uh, History Planning Month Committee, I'd like to welcome you all to today's discussion. Um, needless to say, it's a topic that's been very, very spoken about, uh, especially in light of some of the things that have been happening in professional football and entertainment and so many other things. And it's uh, the discussion that's been kind of curdling under for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's something that uh, we're certainly glad to be able to bring you this, this time. Uh, first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our presenter this, uh, this morning. Uh, Emmanuel Daphnis, our esteemed colleague, was born in Boston, Massachusetts to immigrant parents from Haiti. Uh, he's the director of our Step Up the College program here at BCC, and he's also an adjunct instructor for history and sociology. Many uh, received his bachelor's degree in African American studies from Grand Nice University, and then he went on to get a master's in public health from Tufts University. Quite an interesting bit, I think very appropriately. But then he went on to attend the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, where he received his Masters of Divinity. In addition to his uh, work here at BCC, Manny is the lead pastor for the Dominion Church International in Brockton, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. From the pulpit or in academia, Manny is passionate about raising the awareness of his listeners as a means of attaining true freedom and justice. Manny currently resides in Brockton with his wife and three children. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce you to Manny Daphne. Yes. Thank you, Milton, for that warm and gracious intro. This is a packed house, and um, I'm just really happy to see you all here. Can y'all hear me well? I kind of have a tendency to move around and talk with my hands, so uh, don't hate appreciate. Uh, and uh, my hope today is to facilitate conversation. I certainly don't want to, to lecture. Uh, you've had the opportunity to attend classes here and the like, and you get a ton of lecture. So what I'd like for you to do is to feel empowered to raise your hand and stop me and ask a question, and we can dialogue back and forth. This is supposed to be a conversation. To just give you kind of a brief overview of what this time will entail, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the word nigger. And we're gonna talk a little bit about not just how it's transpired over time historically here in the US, but certainly where we are in terms of its usage in contemporary language and culture today. It's a pretty hot topic. Um, just yesterday, I uh, saw an article uh, and a news report on ESPN where the NFL is thinking about banning the use of the word. I'm not sure if any of you saw that, uh, but banning the use of the word. Uh, and and it's a, the first offense is a 15-yard penalty, like a personal foul for any of you football avid fans. Uh, and then the second offense is an immediate ejection. Isn't that kind of crazy? You know, um, and then the flip side of the NFL, too, is, you know, the NFL, uh, by some kind of real kind of racist thinkers called the NFL the Negro Felon League. Um, and it's called that because of the implications that, you know, what happens in the NFL is a bunch of brute, barbaric, quote unquote, niggers are out there trying to kill each other. It's real interesting to think about some of the racial undertones even today that still exist. And so, Henceforth, this discussion. I hope that you would feel empowered to ask questions, to think about the conversation, but then even beyond our time here, continue the dialogue, because I believe the dialogue is important. All right. 
Cool. So a history of the N-word. Nigger, also spelled nigar, like many words in its original form, didn't necessarily have this derogatory connotation. All it initially meant was black, right? That's all it really referred to initially. But particularly here in the US, this uh, quickly changed. And for those of you who are accustomed with our history, what we know is as slavery came about here starting in 1607 in Jamestown, Virginia, this term slave first started off not as slave, it was indentured servants who came initially, but then with the uh, transatlantic slave trade, slaves began to be utilized more commonly towards the latter portion of the 17th century. And then in the US, this term nigger, that initially meant black, began to carry with it this negative derogatory connotation. This connotation was so significant that oftentimes slaves were not called a name, they were their first name. Nigger was almost like a, a surname, uh, 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 like a, a title, almost like Mr. So you'd call a slave Nigger John or Nigger Jim and you wouldn't necessarily give him a name because all he was at this time was simply a nigger. Now, let's think about the implications of this just for a moment. First, you take a slave from his context, from his family, you rip him from his identity. And then he's here and as he's here, he no longer has a name rather He's referred to as nigger or whatever, right? And what you're in essence doing is placing upon this slave a label. What you're placing upon him is this label of second class subservient existence, not even an individual, you're a nigger. And this is what comes about. Uh, particularly early on with the history of the term. In the era of enslavement, the words nigger or black were inserted in front of this common first name as we just shared. And again, nigger John, nigger Jim. And, and this image here gives you a picture of what a, a typical flyer would look like. And here's what it would, it, here's what it would say. This comes from uh, 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 1769 to be sold a cargo of 94 prime healthy Negroes consisting of the 39 men, 15 boys, etc. just arrived. And again, perpetuating this thought of second tiered, second class uh, uh, cargo, commodities, not people. So as time progresses, what do we have? As time progresses, Slavery continues and we get through slavery and we're gonna try to rush through history because today I really wanna talk about the more contemporary uh, issues facing this term. But what do we see? We see uh, this terminology continued to be utilized even post Civil War, even post emancipation. And as it's utilized, we see pictures that continue to kind of corroborate this second tiered, second class commodity. Not necessarily an individual, but an entity. Similar, if you will, to cattle. This ignorance is perpetuated and what ensues is the continued dehumanization of people of African descent. And so we're talking here from 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, the continued perpetuation here of this term utilized in this uh, uh, dehumanizing, derogatory way into the 20th century, and it continues. And as we look at the history, we see pictures like this. We see pictures like this. We see things for rent to colored, no dogs, no Negroes, no Mexicans, no niggers, no Jews, no dogs. And this becomes our history, 
our history that helps to kind of impact even our present. I want to make sure that that connection is made. And you see images such as this. You see images which present Negroes as happy-go-lucky, watermelon-loving, fried chicken, plantation, hanging, two coons, axle grease. These are the images you see for Negroes. The nigger toe rag, this jolly nigger toy savings bank. From this picture, you get a, a, a sense here of what transpires with this toy. You pull down the lever, and because the, the uh, uh, presentation of the typical nigger was with the big lips, the typical African uh, big lips, so you pull down the lever, his mouth would open wide because it had to open wide for his love for the watermelon. And you have these perpetuations of these stereotypes. And his mouth opens wide, you stick a coin in, and there you go. You have the toy savings bank of the jolly nigger. Now, again, this is our history. This is uh, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century America, United States of America. And now we're into the 20th century. And in the 20th century, as we look at our history, we continue to see these derogatory images. Go back to Africa, Negroes. Now, can't help but talk a little bit about our buddy Mark Twain and Huckleberry Finn. How many of y'all have ever read Huck Finn? Good. Many of you. It's a common book assigned to children early on, right? Pretty early on. And if you recall, you recall the kind of common usage of this term, nigger. Quick excerpt. It warrant the grounding that didn't keep us back but a little. We blowed out a cylinder head. Good gracious. Anybody hurt? No, but I killed a nigger. Well, it's lucky because sometimes people do get hurt. And I want to make sure we see what's even perpetuated in our educational system today, today. There's always kind of this, you know, disclaimer before Mark Twain's Huck Finn is read, you know, um, you've got to be cognizant that this was written at a later time, at an earlier time. But then the question becomes, then why if we've truly made such change and such progress that it's continued? Food for thought. But do you see, do, do, do you see the undertone here? What's being stated here is, no one got hurt, but I killed a nigger. Oh, OK, good thing that no one, no one got hurt. And the picture, the implication, the undertone from our historical legacy is that people of African descent, again, weren't people, weren't people. Now, not sure how many of you have taken kind of uh, uh, history two here where we talk a little bit about the second half of kind of US history. Um, one of the most uh, famous uh, uh, acts by FDR, end of the 1930s, was the WPA. WPA, y'all familiar with the WPA? Some of you, anyway? Uh, Workers Project Administration. This was post Great Depression. And uh, Roosevelt, FDR, put to work nearly three million folks, mostly illiterate, undereducated, put them to work on, you know, kind of uh, 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 public works projects, roads, et cetera. A ton of education wasn't needed. But one of the things that came out of that was this federal writing project. And what happened there was uh, a number of ex-slaves, we're in the 1930s, where we still had some former slaves still living, elderly, but still living. A group of them were interviewed. And this is a quote from one. Freedom is all right, but the niggas was better off before surrender. If he was sick, massa and missus looked after him. And if he needed store medicine, it was brought and given to him. He didn't have to pay nothing. They didn't even have to think about clothes nor nothing like that. They was woven and made and given to them. Maybe everybody's mass and missus wasn't good as Master George and Miss Bessie, 
but they was the same as a mammy and pappy to us niggers. Again, I want to ensure that we're hearing the implications of the history and how the term nigger kind of helped to not just reinforce, but it really became almost a picture embodying the historical legacy. Here you have a slave kind of reminiscing back upon her enslaved days. And there are a ton of historical reasons as to why, particularly the lack of opportunity given to slaves post-Civil War, right? And given all of the Jim Crow restrictions that happened then. But the picture here is we're seeing the legacy of this term. We're seeing the legacy of the term. Another example, and I don't want to belabor it, but now here we are, 1930s, 1920s. This goes back uh, 1920s here, Renaissance uh, uh, era. Um, County Cullen describes an incident. Once riding old Baltimore, heart filled, head filled with glee, I saw a Baltimorean keep looking straight at me. Now I was eight and very small and he was no whit bigger. And so I smiled, he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December. Of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. You got a picture here of one of uh, uh, the Renaissance era's most profound and influential writers thinking and reflecting upon, again, the implications of this term and what this term has meant to them. This quote comes from Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. In it, he speaks upon his encounter and experience. And it just, again, gives you a snapshot. Very soon after I went to live with Mr. and Mrs. All, Chief very kindly commenced to teach me the ABC. Mr. All found out what was going on and at once forbade Mrs. All to instruct me further, telling her, if you give a nigger an inch, he will take an L. A nigger should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told to do. Learning would spoil the best nigger in the world. Now said he, if you teach that nigger, speaking of myself, how to read, there would be no keeping him. It would forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and of no value to his master. As to himself, it could do him no good but a great deal of harm. It would make him discontented and unhappy. These words sank deep into my heart, stirred up sometimes within that lay slumbering and called into existence an entirely new train of thought. I now understood what had been to me a most perplexing difficulty to wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. From that moment, I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. What do you think? What do you think Douglas is talking about when he's talking about the pathway? What's the pathway? Knowledge. Knowledge. Just shout it out. Education. Reading. Education. Right. I think y'all are all right on. What Douglas certainly kind of lays here in his narrative is the foundation for what truly leads to real and total emancipation. Not just the law, not just the system, but really an education that gives you the opportunity to understand not what someone tells you is right versus wrong, but what you deem what's right versus what's wrong. In education, knowledge, starting with basics of literacy. Now, that's Douglas. 100 years later, we get Malcolm X. And Malcolm X, too, shares some kind of provocative thoughts and thinking about, again, this term and its implications. To understand this, you have to go back to what the Young Brothers here referred to as the House Negro and the Field Negro back during slavery. There were two kinds of slaves, the House Negro and the Field Negro. The House Negroes 
They lived near the master and they loved the master more than the master loved himself. Whenever the master said we, he said we. That's how you can tell a house Negro he identified himself more with the master than his master identified with himself. In those days, he was called a house nigger. And that's what we call them today because we've still got some house niggers running around here. Who do you think Malcolm X is referring to when he's talking about house niggers? What's the implications here? What's he really getting at? Yes? They turn on their own color. Turn on their own color. Maybe they won't stand for what's right. Maybe it's individuals that rather than truly seeking justice, kind of go along to get along. And maybe there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but is there? Particularly, again, as we're looking at the implications here of what this means beyond just a term, but really in terms of a legacy of, of uh, people. Dr. King, in his letter from a Birmingham jail, adds this to this dialogue. When you are humiliated day in, day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respected title of Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. Again, the implication here is this total degeneration, dehumanization carried out by this term, fueling this undercurrent of something's got to be done. In a lot of ways, it kind of parallels Malcolm X's thought. Something's got to be done. Something's got to be done. No Vietnamese ever called me a nigger. What do you think this speaks to? An African-American veteran whose return from the Vietnam War, where he served his country, and he comes home back to his country, and he's still treated as second class or second tiered citizen. You know why? And you know how? Not just via rules and regulations, but via a culture that utilizes terminology such as this word nigger to perpetuate this divide, this second class citizenry. Now, this comes 1994. You see Berkeley, and you're kind of appalled that this is, you know, kind of this current. This is only 20 years ago. Rejoice, you cry, baby niggers. It's affirmative action month. Town hall meeting will not save you. The wet backs or the chinks, your failures are hereditary. Can't be corrected by these liberals. When I see you in class, it bugs the hell out of me because you're taking the seat of someone qualified. You belong at Cooley High Law. Don't you forget. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting when you think about it. So even 100, 150 years post emancipation, 2014, right? We still continue to have some of these same sentiments that exist in our common culture. With that stated, I want to now, with this kind of historical context and backdrop, and again, we're talking about 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s even. But really, 
begin to talk about kind of the more contemporary view of this term, particularly given how radically it's shifted over the last 40 to 50 years. Before we go through with presentation, continuing presentation, I want to show a, a, a brief video that kind of depicts it. Now, there are so many different things here as we think about the contemporary use. But I thought that video really kind of gives a uh, decent picture of what we're talking about in terms of the usage of the term in today's, within today's kind of millennial generation, if you will, Gen Xers, Gen Yers. Uh, it seems like there's this almost kind of cavalier free use of the term totally disconnecting it from its historical context, reclaiming it and changing its use. Um, Nas here featured on the left uh, is one of today's, he's been around some time, you know, but he's a, you know, current hip hop artist. And um, one of his, one of his uh, latest works, we'll go back to this slide, is uh, entitled Just Regular Niggers, Diaries of a Porch Monkey, and a 2012 album. But I want you to see this chorus, because it kind of exemplifies what we're talking about here. I'm a nigger, he's a nigger, she's a nigger, we some niggers. Wouldn't you like to be a nigger too? All my kite niggers, big niggers, guinea niggers, chink niggers. That's right, y'all, my niggers too. Okay, this is sufficient for me. Um, but you see the picture here. The picture here is, it's no longer this derogatory term. It's a term that defines us all. Matter of fact, it's a unifying term today, a term that no longer <laughs> separates, but a term that today simply brings us together. Yes? Collectively, uh, as a group, this small group right here, mm -hmm. if you measured it across the country, proportionally, you would have a million or so people with an idea to change. <clears throat> Collectively, you can change that. If you do it collectively on every university across the nation, this can change. It won't happen because he said it in this corner, you said it in that corner, or they said it back mm -hmm. here, or we said it over here. It's, it's something that has to start here or wherever and branch out and grow. Hmm. It's just like taking a child and boring your child. Mm. Teaching your child that it's improper. Mm. But on a magnified basis, I'm saying the standard quote is status quo is what goes around, comes around, you do me, I do you dirty. You do me clean, I do you clean. You do me dirty, I do you dirty. Same thing. How did it catch on? Mm. As, as educated in this academia, we qualify to change that. Mm. Every single one of you here. If you went back to the 1960s, when the war was stopped in Vietnam, it was stopped by the college people, mm. by the parents, and by the society itself. It changed its own, it changed its own way of thinking. Mm. That's what you have here amongst you. That's what you have now. He mm. asked the question, he asked, he says, what do we have? We have the power to change it. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. In response to that, you said the kids can change, the people can make a change. That word in itself is so commercially successful. Like I have not heard a song in the last 10 years that has not had that word in yep. it. There's a song on the radio right now that's that have changed to my hitters that gets blared off constantly. That's yep. all I hear mm -hmm. is that song on the radio. Mm -hmm. I feel like the way the word is currently and the commercial success of the word, that right. word's not going nowhere. To me, I, I actually want to think, though, 
beyond kind of what you're looking at in terms of surface. I'd like to think about why is there such commercial success with the utilization of the term? Why is that? To me, to me that's the heart of the debate. The word in itself incites, it, 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 it can incite rage, mm -hmm. incite a smile, but it incites, the word itself incites something mm. out of you, like it gets something out of you. Mm. Mm. There, was, there was another hand somewhere? Yes. Well, the reason why I think it's so commercialized is because we let it become commercialized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're trying to stop something when you pretty much just boycott it. Mm. You, you, you had your hand up again? Yeah. yeah. Well, over here, I mean, it's not about what you say or what you feel. It's, it's got to be accepted by everybody. I mean, we all have a statement to make. We all have an opinion to take. And it's reasonable to, uh, to disagree. Mm -hmm. And when we disagree, it doesn't mean that we got to go to arms and we got to go to battle. Look at around here, there's nobody hurting nobody, there's nobody, you know, jumping over. Oh, I'm not just making you, you got long fingernails, bro. You, know, you got eyelashes that scare me, whatever, you know. I mean, that's not what's going on right here. And 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 <clears throat> kidding around, all joking aside, it isn't about all of that, you know. It's like we have competed with other countries in this world and we consider ourselves to be number one. So why? when it comes to something so potent as this, can we get together and do something about it? Hmm. Interesting. Yes, go ahead. Well, my name is Mike. Hello, Mike. Welcome to uh, our group. I believe the word nigga is not going to go anywhere. Hmm. I believe nigga is going to be in our vocabulary forever. I'm not prejudiced. Mm -hmm. I don't like the use of it, but I've tried in the past to say, what's up, my nigga? I'm like, let's see what's going on. <laughs> Didn't work, huh? <laughs> they Jackie Chan you, huh? <laughs> the race of the African American, they can use it amongst themselves okay. and enjoy it. Hmm. But I just kept doing it. What's up, my nigga? What's up? Until they accepted it. These are my friends. Hmm. A couple of them are straight from Africa, from mm -hmm. America. Mm -hmm. And um, whatever happened, happened. Mm. Okay, now there, there's significant hands up in response to that. <laughs> Let's go from one hand back here. It's not going to go anywhere. It's not going anywhere. We, we, we hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so a hand in the back, and then you, and then all over. <laughs> oh, sorry, Chief. I'm just responding to the video. Now they yeah. said that, you know, the kids in the school stuff, we, we claim this word. It's now a positive thing. Mm -hmm. But if it's such a positive word, why can't it be used by everyone? Uh huh. Because if, it's, if something is inherently good, uh -huh. it's inherently positive, and you have changed that, yeah. then you have changed that for everybody. Right. Really. Not just for some people. Like he was saying, it's okay for some people to say it, and no matter how positively I say it, you, it won't be accepted right. at all. Okay, so it's not so, so okay for you. How did something that's so inherently positive, we have changed that word, then you would be able to use it across everywhere, everyone. Okay, so back here, yes. So I'm going through like this growth process right now where I'm learning all about my own privileges. Uh-huh. Right. 
So I saw three hands here. I want to start with you, then you, and then you. Okay, good. Go ahead. I'm speaking on the level of being in, in academia. My first year coming from law enforcement, Providence, 23 years. Hearing the word used all the time, like this, you were saying, um, as white people, we can't use it. And the kids I was doing on the tech would call each other, and I was offended by them calling it each other. But I was offended, not them. I don't like the word. I, my son grows up in Smithfield, Rhode Island. He's 12. He doesn't know what the word is. If he ever said it, he would get a smack. Okay, it starts in the family. I'm older than you guys. It starts in the family. My son will never listen to music with that word in it. Okay? He will get a smack if he uses the word. He doesn't even know when he's 12 what the word is. So I'm just saying, um, coming from police to academia, the word, again, it's just me, family, morals and values, where it stops. You, you guys are a different generation than me. I'm much older. So as a mother, my child will not grow up saying that because of me. Steve, then, what's it? I think, I think we all will be very surprised if we live to the next 10 years or so, because people are integrating. Nowadays, you can't tell who's Chinese from Japanese, from French. English, from black, whatever. Everybody calling everybody my nigga. You see what I mean? So a few years from now, as bad as this word is, mm -hmm. It's not going to make very much difference to anybody because the, the times are changing and right. everybody are getting in, integrated with each other. Mm. And this is the old time mm. passing <coughs> that young people is changing rapidly. Yeah. Maybe they're going about it the wrong way, yeah. but, but level, if we look at it on a deeper level, we can see that it is changing rapidly and mm. nobody will be to say, well, you are a white southern person. White southern person is mixing with blacks, black North Americans, and things are changing. Hmm. You and then you. <coughs> well, um, sorry, my voice is kind of gone, but I grew up overseas and my entire life until I was about 14. That's when I moved to the States. Mm -hmm. Never heard the word used until I got to the States. Lived in London for five years, was in high school there, never had a use. I was at, in London is a very diverse city, um, basically split more religiously than it is uh, when it comes to color, I guess. Like, but I, I, my, I don't mean to offend you, sir, but my dad um, came home and he had the same kind of reaction. He just got satellite radio on his car and my hitter came on, but not the censored version. And he comes to me, and he's 54 years old, and he goes, so, listen to the radio today. Am I allowed to use it now? Because everyone seems to be using it now. Hmm. And I said, well, Dad, I'm, I'm really happy you came to me. <laughs> uh, I went, I used to live in Springfield. I lived in my own apartment in Springfield for a couple years. And I said, this, this is, you, no. No. <laughs> no is the answer. And... I, I, I think that everyone is great fans. I think that the word, I don't know if the word's going to go away or not. Because it is new, it, it, controversy music. It, it's, I mean, you got, everybody's using it. And um, I think, I personally, I don't use it. But I don't get offended when uh, African -American, Americans or blacks use it. Because I believe that after 2,000 years of unchecked, prosperity as a white male, I don't have the right to comment on someone else's uh, like tortured uh, ancestry. So in my opinion, I think that it's, I have my own opinions on the way I think it, I mean, I think it sucks. Cause it's just cause it's, I think it has a lot of negative complications. But growing up internationally and just knowing how the past has been, I, I don't think that I have any power over it. Okay. One, two, three, four. On, on the current move, the, the, the woman's correct, the correction officer, she said she was from Smithfield. I feel like I've been to Smithfield, I've gone days in Smithfield while I've seen a black face. So there's such a cultural divide when she says that. Like, I don't understand how you can say, okay, your, your son doesn't even see black people. If your son was growing up on Cookie Row, around all My son sees black people because most of my friends from the police department are black too. Because they're arresting them. Very, what did you just say? Because they're arresting them. No, no, no. Did you just hear what I said? I said, my friends. 
I hang. I have African American friends. I have Latino friends. So Smithfield, Rhode Island, does have some diversity. Okay. By some man, you mean no, no, no. Listen, white my, I got a friend listen, who lives in Smithfield. So that would be more <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> Italian culture, coming from policing, and now being academia, not to use that word, because I think it's offensive. But you're right as far as the music. I totally agree. But I won't allow myself. I'm saying that I have a direct effect on my son, just like I think some parents should and also. That's a beautiful thing, because no, no, that, and what, I'm trying to, right. what I'm trying to say is, like, you're from Smith, mothers that live I'm on Fulky Row. So I'm from no, Mark but Rock. I'm saying, the mothers that live on Fulky Row and mothers that are living on Fifth Street aren't teaching their kids these things, okay? I agree. No, no, I agree. No, no, you're absolutely right. But coming from me, I'm saying that's why I'm saying it starts in the home. All right, let, 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 let's let let's let's broaden this discussion. It's from there. You have to understand what I'm saying. It's it's, it's becoming diverse. When I grew up, I totally agree with you. But me as a person coming from police into academia, I have to teach my son. Just like I'm hoping every other parent does. And when you become a parent, but you're right as far as the music, I totally agree. With you. All right, so we got here, we got here, <laughs> we got one. I, I, then two, then three, then four, five, yeah, one. I, was so say, one. I think there's a bit of a dislike because I think in a good way, a lot of us in this room have never really experienced overt racism in front of us, partially because of where we are geographically, because there's a lot more accepting of, of different races and cultures. I went to school in Virginia, Mississippi, and I remember going out with my friends and having guys point us and go, uh-uh, no, no, you can't come in here. Can't come in here with your friends. You can come in here. Maybe not your friends, right? And I had grown up in Fall River, and I went down there, and the first time I saw that, I was like, I looked at my friend, and I said, is this guy for real? <laughs> and he goes, I hate to say it, but he is. You know? And I think because so many people don't see that in their face, see the reality of that, that it devalues this stuff. Right? It devalues the fear of these words and their meaning and their connotation. Because yeah. in a way, it sounds strange to say it, in a way we're a bit spoiled that we live in a place that is as diverse as it is. But when you go someplace where there is not, and one of the false assumptions we can make is that we feel that this country is a lot more hip to this stuff than we think it is. But let me tell you something. There is plenty of places still left in this country where it is not like here. People do not get accepted. People do not get treated well. You will be asked to leave if you go there with your friends. Right? In incredibly well stated. So I want to just kind of call on hands that haven't gone up yet, that haven't spoken yet. Um, and so, so my bad for the repeaters, but let's we'll start with one, two, three, four. So we'll start with you. So it seems like, at, at least what I'm hearing you say, it seems like there is a stark change in terms of what is acceptable, in terms of its usage, and also its meaning, seemingly. Right. right? And, and like you said, too, like I told my daughters when they come home and, they, and they're saying that, says, you know, you're going to walk into the wrong place and say that to the wrong person, and you're going to be in trouble. You're going to, you're going to, you know, you're going to cross the wrong path and say that to somebody that you shouldn't be saying it. Right. So it may be accepted, you know, among certain, you know, races or, or however you want to put it, but sometimes it's not accepted, like you said. So, right. You know, and then you're gonna, and, and that's where you may decide to be maybe violent or just or whatnot. I don't, I don't like when my daughter's felt that way. Hmm. Um, I mean, 
growing up, did, did your mom say that in the house? I mean, I don't understand. I, I don't understand the whole like everything in the studios. I just don't understand the whole concept. I think it comes from that, like a bottom of term to everybody. Like for yeah. you guys personally, it was a bad term for some of the call you guys that, and then now you guys in your ways alone are the ones that are using it the most freely. Like, how did it turn out? Right. Your guys growing up, did your mom? Okay. Did, did your mom say? You did my mom? Did your mom say to you growing up? I want to respond. I want to respond to the question in this way. Um, there is a variety of experiences within the African American race. Um, you know, Afro Caribbean, shoot, African African, right? Folks uh, come up differently and have different cultural norms. Um, growing up for me personally, it wasn't a term that was utilized. It wasn't a term utilized in my home. But that doesn't you know, mean that that was the kind of universal truth for everybody. What we began to sense was a shifting in terms of what was acceptable kind of societally, socially, but never really fully addressing kind of the underlying kind of undercurrent that the term still carried. So there was one hand here, and then there was multiple hands, but we'll go one, two, three, four. Start you. So growing up in this generation where it's used a lot, mm -hmm. it is very confusing, and um, I don't think it's OK for one race to say the word and another race it's not OK. I think it's not okay for everybody to use the word. Mm -hmm. Because if people are using the word, it's just going to grow. Mm -hmm. And if you stop using the word, it's going to become extinct. No one's going to use it anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to go anywhere unless everybody <laughs> stops, use, stops using it. Not just one race. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, <laughs> go ahead. Um, I, was, I, I don't. I like the word at all. I'm 100% Canadian. I've never used it. I don't like it. I work with kids, and when they use it, I redirect them not to use it. I don't think it's acceptable. But to go back to the young lady who said, when did it become socially acceptable? I think the significant shift in pop culture with the N-word was when, I believe it was NWA's album came yeah. out, and with Nancy Reagan, it was a huge controversial thing with the parental advisory and all of that. And I think that's when it kind of made its way into pop culture and then it kind of became this word where, you know, that group, NWA, was like, we're taking the word back, it's our word, you can't right. tell us, you can't use it. And right. that's when it kind of started, and I think it started in gang life and it kind of spread that way. And if you said it, you were a hood, you were a thug, and then it kind of trickled down, like everything does culturally. Like, you know, rap music and jazz was only for black people, and then it kind of trickled into the white community, and then, then all of a sudden, the, you know, the music is making the white kids do awful things, and that's why they can't be a parental advisor, and they can't listen to swear words. So I think that's a big cultural shift. OK. So there are two hands back here, or actually three or four. Um, so I, I, you had a hand up, then, then you, then, then you, then you. OK, so let's go. You first, yep, yep. kind of an interesting different way of looking at this. As a communicator, I work in communication. Are we, I think kind of what we're seeing here is, do we give the word more power to hurt hmm. by not allowing it to evolve? As the one person in the tape was saying, words evolve. Hmm. And kind of taking that power back is what I'm sort of hearing some people say. And there's a whole, in South Providence where I worked for quite a while, uh, a lot of the, the kids, well, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it. What they were artic articulating when I would ask them is that if we don't, uh, the word's not going away, as I think we've all agreed. So if we don't change the meaning of it and allow it to evolve, it's kind of like take the night back idea. 
And I don't know, what do you guys think about that? Is that valid or is that just what these kids are saying hmm. to appease? Yeah. Well, that's absolutely what's being stated more broadly in the broader culture. It's not you know, uh, localized to that segment. The broader sentiment is we can now reclaim this word that was formerly utilized to harm and you know, uh, dehumanize. We can take it back. Right. 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 I think by not using it, you give it more power, though. Well, that's where hmm. when we say the N word, just that phrase is saying this is such an abomination. Yeah. Hmm. It's kind of like you think of the Harry Potter words, they couldn't say Voldemort, right? Because it was such an abomination. <laughs> Are we giving it more power? Hmm. Really good question. Back here. Mm. All right, so uh, you spoke already. You did, I think. Did you? You did. I'm going to try to get folks who haven't spoken yet. Yes. I, uh, I used to live in Atlanta, and I think that there's actually a big distich- distinction between using the word nigger, like above and below the Mason Dixon line. When I was living down in Atlanta, I didn't live in the nicest part, you know, and I, myself, and my friends were the only white kids in the whole neighborhood. And I would be sitting out on my back porch, and I'd hear little kids use the word, and their ma would smack literally the shit out of them for using it. Because still down there, I feel like it holds that hurt in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And like I used to work at the airport, and we were like the only white guys throwing bags. I'd never heard a single black man or woman use that word. It was only the white folks who meant it with disdain that would use it, you know, saying, oh, you know, this nigga lost my bag. And I, like, being from up here, I was like, kind of like shell shock, like I had never heard it used like that. And it made me feel sick inside. Mm. So I feel like still up here, it's becoming more of a pop culture word. We're still in parts of the South that is still that use of disdain and almost like a second rate citizen. That's an absolutely dead on point. There was a hand up over there, yeah. Okay. Hmm. I've got a, a several repeat hands. Unfortunately, due to time, I want to take a couple, and then we're gonna be out of time. But uh, let me take a couple who haven't spoken. Right over here. Yeah. Personally, I I don't. It doesn't affect me as much or affect anybody that I know. 
I personally have a lot of myself. And it doesn't really bother me. I don't even say the word at all. I just, I just, I just consider what the, what the human being is, not the what their color is, mostly. Okay. And I think my hope is that you've got uh, peers who feel <laughs> similarly. Okay. Okay. That's okay. We're gonna go with you in a minute. Go ahead. Now, for the sake of time, we don't got none. You're going to be the last comment I take. And then I, 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 I want to share some comments to kind of close out. Thank you for sharing that. Now, I want to just share a couple of things as we you know, have to kind of close out this discussion. There are certainly you know, differing perspectives upon the usage of this word. Clearly, uh, in this room, kind of as a small microcosm of what we're seeing really across the country in terms of this, we have those who feel that the word has changed and its meaning has changed. It's evolved and we ought to embrace it because it is a term of endearment, not a term of, of you know, a derogatory slur as it once was. While you have the opposite end of the spectrum where folks really feel incredibly aghast at just hearing the word because of the deep historical legacy that the word comes from and what it brings forth thereafter. The purpose of education isn't necessarily to tell you this is right versus this is wrong. The purpose is to equip you with the tools to then come to your own decision and your own conclusion. What I hope this conversation began to bring forth for you is a renewed understanding of the long historical legacy of this term. And then compared to the more recent evolving in terms of its usage of the term, there has to be a consideration made 
as to whether or not we accept what society deems is acceptable and you know the newest latest fad as acceptable to us or we determine based upon the education and the understanding of our history with that in place we determine whether or not we're going to choose to utilize certain terms uh, and certain uh, uh, expressions <laughs> that come from a legacy of not just pain, but the perpetuation of second-tiered citizenry. With that stated, I am out of time, but I hope My hope, my hope is, in closing, that this conversation doesn't become divisive. Rather, it empowers you to gain a greater appreciation for some of those who've come before you, and ultimately helps to serve as a forum for you in terms of how you think about the decisions that you make in terms of usage of words and attitudes towards others. Thank you.